shelters are being prepared um, further inspections are being carried out if your home cannot withstand the hurricane or the system that's coming through then we ask you to seek assistance from relatives or friends who are willing to host you A tropical storm is still eyeing parts of the Bahamas as health officials grapple with a growing number of COVID-19 cases. Good morning, everyone. I'm LaDawn Davis, and this is the Morning Edition. Thank you so much for waking up with us. The system in the tropics could dump heavy rain as it moves near our shores. In studio to give us a complete rundown on the movement of the storm is Chief Meteorologist Basil Dean. Good morning, Basil. The system now has a name. It is called Isaias. It's formed uh, during the early morning hours. We now have that circulation at the center that was so badly needed to identify this as a tropical storm. It has also increased in intensity. It's now packing winds of 60 miles per hour, but we don't anticipate any further intensification of this system as it now takes aim for the Dominican Republic. Right now, it's about 160 miles away, and it can give you those coordinates in case you are plotting it. It's, uh, 17.2 degrees north, longitude 67.9 degrees west, moving towards the northwest at 21 miles per hour. Now, the forecast uh, track uh, has not changed much. We still expect it to move uh, near Puerto Rico, which is, uh, well, just south of Puerto Rico at the moment, but heading towards Hispaniola. It will move over Hispaniola within the next 8 to 10 hours, and as it makes landfall, we expect some weakening of this system. However, once once it gets into the waters of the Bahamas uh, sometime tomorrow, we expect some intensification of the system. However, we continue to maintain that it's going to be a very wet storm as it moves through or near the southeast Bahamas on Friday morning. So if you have not made repairs to those roofs and you have leaky conditions, well, you're going to have some issues, but you still have some time to make those roof repairs. And then come Saturday, that system should move pretty much close to the central Bahamas. And then by Saturday, it should be somewhere just to the west of Andros and uh, moving towards the northwest before it makes a landfall in Florida sometime on Saturday night heading into Sunday morning. So there you have it at uh, 5 o'clock uh, this morning, the center of circulation was located at 17.2 degrees north longitude 67.9 west moving towards the northwest at 21 miles per hour maximum sustained winds now at 60 miles per hour but we expect that to drop off once it makes landfall with the Dominican Republic later on today. Adon. And Basil, any reasons why I guess the shift in the system and I know you were talking about it I guess yesterday but are you able to tell us a little bit more about the shift in this particular system? Well there has not been a shift in the system but there has been intensification of the system remember for quite a while it was just holding at 45 mile per hour sustained winds but we did not have the closed circulation and hence we it dubbed it a potential tropical cyclone but now that we have that closed circulation at the surface it has now adopted the name Isaiah's and Isaiah's will continue moving out towards the northwest over the next uh, day or two coming very close to the southeast Bahamas on Friday uh, morning but by Thursday that's the tonight, uh, they will begin to experience uh, those heavy rain showers around uh, the Turks and Caicos Islands and the Inagua area, and that will gradually work its way up into the central Bahamas as we head into Friday. Thanks a lot, Basil. Meantime, a team from the National Emergency Management Agency is also in close collaboration with key stakeholders as the storm makes its movement. Director of NEMA Captain Stephen Russell spoke on the possibility of evacuation in low-lying areas. There will not be the need to evacuate persons from their respective islands. There may be the need, however, to move persons from one location to the next within the islands. Like I mentioned, in the, um, er some areas of Andrews, there are some where the creeks and low-lying areas are along the coast. People may have to move from along the coast more into the interior of, of uh, Abaco and uh, um, and Andrews in this, in, this, in this case here. Director of the Department of Social Services, Lillian Quant Forbes, spoke to shelter demands and what is required. These shelters, when they are opened, we will have medical personnel, inclusive of RBDF personnel and social workers. I'd like to say, too, to our residents, please prepare your home 
so that you could stay there. If your home cannot withstand the hurricane or the system that's coming through, then we ask you to seek assistance from relatives or friends who are willing to host you. Meantime, the Minister of State in the Ministry of Disaster Preparedness, Management and Reconstruction, Iron Lewis, speaks to the current preparations on Grand Bahama, which remains on its two-week lockdown. Hurricane shelters are being prepared. Um, further inspections are being carried out in Grand Bahama. So everyone has been given their mandate with what to do with respect to being ready. We will make a call with respect to opening up our EOC, perhaps by Friday afternoon, certainly no later than Sunday. And like I said, even though we're not expecting um, any sort of a hurricane, we will still be in a position just in the event that something shifts. All of our shelter, shelter workers are fully aware, our team from the Ministry of, of Health, they are fully aware um, of the protocol. Our transportation department is fully aware. And in fact, all of the various emergency support functions are, and our partners are fully aware of the COVID-19 protocols. And like I said, we are also in discussion with the city manager, Mr. Troy McIntosh. Uh, one of the concerns uh, is that there are still some debris to be collected. Um, we don't want any unnecessary projectiles on the streets. As the country watches the current developments in the tropics, the COVID-19 cases are still showing an upward trend. Health officials say there were 37 new confirmed cases on Wednesday, with 32 of them in Grand Bahama and five here in New Providence. This pushes the overall COVID-19 cases in the country to 484. With Grand Bahama still leading with 243 cases, concerns mount on that island. Italia Hall speaks with the Deputy Prime Minister on the outlook for Grand Bahama. K. Peter Turnquist says the two-week lockdown is unfortunate news for Grand Bahama. But when the government made the decision to reopen the borders, they did not expect Bahamians to travel to Florida, which is a COVID-19 hotspot. The DPM and East Grand Bahama MP says he knows the lockdown is a disappointment for many Bahamians, but it is necessary. We have certainly advised people that they ought to have traveled only for very essential needs and not for the usual shopping or, or holiday experience, given the fact that the virus is still very live uh, in the United States. Um, uh, it, it appears uh, from the data so far that uh, most of the cases that came back uh, in, into the country um, came from uh, uh, these overseas uh, visits. There is now community spread on Grand Bahama, and as a result, the DPM says a lockdown will help to bring the situation under control, especially since the Rand Memorial Hospital is challenged. We cannot afford to have uh, uh, a, a spike in cases uh, that becomes unmanageable uh, for the facilities that we have. Uh, and so um, the advice of the, the healthcare uh, team is that we lock it down now, get it under control, As it relates to the rise in cases, the Deputy Prime Minister says there is no one to blame. The government continues with its support programs to try and ease that um, burden somewhat. We know that we can't uh, uh, help everybody and we can't fix the situation for everyone. Uh, but we're doing our best to provide uh, business support through tax credits and, and tax deferrals, as well as through uh, uh, credit facilities through the Small Business Development Center. Um, uh, assistance for individuals through NIB and, and social service. And as for what Grand Bahamians can expect following the two-week lockdown, the DPM says you can expect a slow pickup in tourist travel. Uh, because I'm sure that uh, we will uh, observe some different protocols uh, uh, with respect to the reopening of the borders. Um, we can also anticipate that some of the projects that are uh, on the table uh, will be delayed. Um, uh, as a result of this COVID-19 experience. Um, so that means that the return to economic um, growth uh, for uh, Grand Bahamas, as well as for the Bahamas in general, is going to be slow. Uh, that means that we have to uh, ensure that, one, uh, we value the jobs that we have, two, that we uh, ensure that we uh, uh, utilize uh, all of our resources wisely. 
Turnquest, who is currently in quarantine, is asking Grand Bahamans to adhere to the rules during the lockdown. He adds that things may be rough for the next few months, but the government is hopeful that at the end of the year, the state of the economy will improve. It's Halia Hall, ZNS Network News. As the country moves through a second wave of COVID-19 cases, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer Dr. Delon Brennan says changed border protocols, modified contact tracing, and stringent measures for visitors may help with continued efforts. Here's Lloyd Allen. As the country and the world are now in the midst of the quoted second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, new developments are on the local front. And joining us today is Deputy Chief Medical Officer for the country, Dr. Delon Brennan. Speak to us briefly about the uh, adjustments regarding protocols at borders. I know over the past few weeks, we've had some challenges there. Uh, what new developments are taking place? One of the issues um, is that we've noticed that many of our cases are related to travel in one way or the other. Either the case itself traveled or someone who did travel came in contact with them and then it spread within um, the contacts of that case. And so knowing that that, that has become, become a significant issue for us, we had to suggest um, to the government of the Bahamas that we modify that approach so that we can minimize the introduction. That was the reason for some of the restrictions that were put in place at the borders. And uh, speaking about modification and restrictions, I know, of course, uh, Florida was one of those uh, hardest hit states for the U.S. Uh, with new cases developing on a daily basis. But uh, for countries like Mexico and uh, also Brazil, they too have very high numbers. Uh, what does this mean for the country uh, moving forward? Are we, uh, uh, is it now recommended that um, a complete border restriction uh, takes effect or do we still want to continue uh, on the trajectory that we're on? That may not necessarily, you can't always cut yourself off from the world altogether. Anyway, people need to travel. So, you know, that will still be maintained. But when people travel, what you allow them to do or what they do when they come in country is now what we're going to have to spend a little bit more energy and effort on in addressing those issues. Anyone who comes into country, whether a Bahamian resident, a national, or a visitor to the country has to first have a negative COVID-19 test. Um, secondly, they have to quarantine for 14 days or at least 14 days from the time where they arrive in country. And number three, they have to have a COVID-19 PCR test done prior to them being allowed to leave quarantine. And if that test is negative, they can leave quarantine. If it is positive, obviously, we would then continue additional public health measures um, for isolation with them at that time. Are there any considerations for tourists? Sure, for tourists, um, what you would do is you would then you would test negative before you arrive and then for the time period that you're in country so let's say you come in for a shorter period let's say five days you would then be quarantined to the facility where you are going to stay so if that is a hotel if that is a guest house you would then be quarantined to that area but you could not roam about the island um, and go to outside restaurants or outside entertainment facilities you would have to stay within in that facility and then when your five days are up you would be allowed to leave go to the airport or go to a seaport and then exit the country lloyd allen zns network news also health officials maintain that prevention measures are key in order to see a decrease in covid 19 cases infectious disease consultant dr nakia forbes encouraged the public to continue to adhere to all health safety protocols here's jimanita swain Avoid crowds, close spaces, and contact, close contact with people. Keep your physical distance, six feet, wear a mask, hand wash. With COVID-19 cases continuing to rise, persons must take individual responsibility to stay COVID-free. Infectious diseases specialist Dr. Nakia Forbes is reiterating the call for residents nationwide to continue to use proactive measures in the face of what's being dubbed the second COVID wave. She explained the benefits of the mandatory curfews and lockdowns. You are on a 24-hour lockdown. Everyone should be in their homes. So people who are infected and incubating the virus, they will uh, become symptomatic. Some of them will become symptomatic. And if there's any transmission, an additional 14-day period could um, stimmy transmission to new vulnerable people if people are not moving around. 
and therefore they can come forward and be tested and we can do the contact tracing around these persons. It usually takes a number of incubation periods to see a reduction in the number of new cases. She noted that the real results of the first lockdown instituted earlier this year were not evident for about 15 weeks, but it's clear COVID-19 is not going anywhere. Today there are nearly 17 million people that have been reported with COVID-19 in the world and 600 and something plus thousand have died of COVID-19 and about 190 countries are impacted with COVID-19. As we can see, it's going to be here to stay until if and when there's a viable vaccine. And so how do we balance our lives? How do we work, socialize, allow children to go to school? question then is what's the best balance to be achieved until a vaccine is created? We have to change our way of moving around and our habits and things that we're doing. We have to amend our activity for this virus and the fact that there could be people who are infected that are asymptomatic when we go about our day. So if we want to reduce spread and have numbers low and not have a huge problem where the health system is overwhelmed, that's where our individual responsibility comes in, where we follow these instructions to prevent spread. And in that way, maybe we can find some sort of a balance. And that's the only thing we can really hope for right now until there's, a, there's an available vaccine. From all indications, health officials project the availability of a vaccine by 2021. For now, the hope is curfews and compliance work to address community spread in combination with testing. Jim Anita Swain, ZNS Network News. Traffic this morning will be coming to you live here from Market Street. We're in front of the Kwaku Police Station, one of the oldest stations here in the Bahamas. We'll be talking about the one-way street, and we'll also be letting you know about overnight traffic accidents. That coming up after the break. We'll be with you through new beginnings and sunset endings, through toil and many tears, through the joys and many fears. For all of life's ever-changing moments, trust J.S. Johnson Insurance Agents and Brokers for all of your insurance needs. J.S. Johnson Insurance Agents and Brokers, giving you peace of mind. Bonaventure Medical Laboratory at East Avenue Centerville and Sandyport celebrates 20 years of providing quality laboratory services with timely results. While partnering with your physicians and insurance companies, we have expanded into our modernized facility providing EKG testing, the latest in gonorrhea and chlamydia STD tests, rapid tests, fraternity screens, online reporting of results, and also phlebotomy training. Visit or call Bonaventure Medical Lab, open daily at 7.30 a.m. and Saturdays at 8 a.m. or visit our Sandyport or Southside Clinic location. We Buy You Sell offers the best in impact windows and doors. The first line of defense in protecting your home and family with premium designs and affordable pricing. We can make your dream home a reality. We also stock a wide variety of tiles such as porcelain, mosaic, and plank tiles. We offer the lowest rates in the country. Located at number 163 Robinson Road, call 677-2856 or 324-6427. We Buy You Sell. Come and see us today. Hi, welcome to Dream Girls. We offer a wide variety of hair, hair care, and your everyday beauty needs. Here at Dream Girls, we carry a wide variety of products for natural or relaxed hair, such as ORS, Hair Care, and Shea Moisture. We also carry a large selection of weaving, braiding, and crochet hair. You can expect to find a private wig room, a large variety of products, and service with a smile. Whether you're shopping for a party, a corporate event, or your everyday working woman, Dream Girls can make your dream become a reality. Live your dream, experience your dream, Dream Girls. We have three convenient locations to serve you. Village Road Shopping Center, Prince Charles Shopping Center, and Legacy Plaza located on Prince Charles next to BTC Cash and Go. Here at Dream Girls, Enhancing beauty becomes your reality. 
or a loved one currently under medical care? Do you need affordable medical supplies? Ports International is the largest home health care supplier. Our compassionate team is committed to patients and their loved ones. From hospital beds to wound care, wheelchairs to walkers, Ports is a one-stop shop for your medical supplies, and we accept all major insurance. With two locations to serve you, at Airport Industrial Park and Shirley Street, we also ship to the family islands. Visit us on Facebook or call Ports at 377-1771. Traffic is expected to build up this morning as Bahamians make that mad dash to the food stores and water depots to prepare for this storm brewing in the tropics. Charles Fisher is on our streets and joins us live with Thursday's Daily Traffic Commute. The traffic report is sponsored by Bahamas First. First in insurance, today, tomorrow. Good morning once again, Charles Fisher Pinch hitting for Lloyd Island here on Marcus Street, one of the busiest streets here in the capital from early this morning. Cars were up and down. We are joined this morning by Sergeant Cressonia Johnson and Sergeant Johnson from early this morning. We got out here like 5.30 and this place was busy already. Yes, it was extremely busy. But we can see as, as a result of the streets in this area, this is inner city, and we expect to see a lot of pedestrian traffic and vehicular traffic within this area. So this is an expected, this is a norm for this area. Area, and anything that got close this proximity, the Blue Hill Road and Market Street vicinity is. Let's talk about overnight traffic. Yes, overnight we've had a total of 19 accidents, 16 accidents involving damage, 3 accidents involving injury at this time. We have 15 persons who are hospitalized as a result of being involved in a traffic accident. Unfortunately, we had one minor that passed away has come to their injuries last night. Sad news for you. Let's go back now to Market Street. One way, we have a lot of side corners as well, and we notice cars that come out, creeping out, yeah. not paying attention. Yes. Well, as you can see, we can see just from this intersection here, we have a number of things going on. We have increased signage, and we have the fact that these corners, there's, there's a limited uh, margin of error within this um, vicinity. We find that a lot of persons traveling east to west, that then they turn on to Market Street, they want to continue either east or west, and then they end up coming into the pathway of those who are traveling south on Market Street. So we're just advising the general public, if you are to traverse anywhere within the Market Street area, we also know the fact that the, the pedestrians, that there are less pedestrians in this area. So we have to understand that if you're traversing this area, you're not only dealing with the motoring traffic, you're dealing with pedestrian traffic. As a result of that, you're going to need to travel and be more cautious when you're in an area like this. So yes, the streets are more narrow, and you have more persons traveling on east to west coming on to Market Street to travel travel south, or they're asking as much as possible for you to pay attention to the persons who are traversing the street and trying to cross. Those persons, you indeed, pedestrians, you indeed have to stop, look, and listen before you go enter the main road. So as much as possible, pay attention to these simple things. Take these things into consideration. It could save your life. We also have a lot of one-way streets on the mm -hmm. side, and some persons might say, police not coming, nobody's coming, let me sneak through that so I can get to my house or wherever I'm going. Well, the danger in that is persons who are familiar with these streets. So you have persons who are not familiar and persons who are familiar. So if that is the case and you have, you're coming out the one-way streets, they can only go by the signage that's up. So if you're not familiar and you're driving the street, you're not expecting a vehicle to come out that corner. And that is what causes our bad accidents. And we want to discourage that, that activity as much as possible. If you can avoid that, avoid it at all costs. There's no particular reason to come at that corner. These corners are designed this way for a particular reason. So as much as possible, utilize the street the way it's supposed to be utilized. Uh, let's utilize here on Market Street. It's a one-way traffic, two lanes, but the lanes are not... No, they're big. very narrow. And like I said, the streets are narrow for a purpose. More narrow streets call for slower flow of traffic. But as we're seeing, the well, majority of persons who are traveling in this area are going at a high rate of speed for this road condition. So as a result of that, you have, us again, a slim margin of error. Well, once again, I'd like to thank Sergeant Crescenia Johnson for joining us here on Market Street, right in front of the historic Kwaku Street Southern Belize Station. Thanks a lot. Back to you in the studio, Ladon. Thanks a lot, Fisher. The threat of bad weather could very well put a damper on the start of what's expected to be a ripe crawfish season. The morning team caught up with a local fisherman who's preparing his traps for his big catch. Um, all the fishermen are very concerned, and we are um, um, going to wait until it passes before we head out. 
About 4,000 crawfish traps are prepared, set and ready to haul in a big catch come August 1st. But that could all change if a tropical system brewing in the Atlantic make landfall in our waters on that same day. It's a tropical disturbance director of the National Fisheries Association and commercial fisherman Keith Carroll says he's keeping a keen eye on. The storm right now get everybody in neutral. We, we um, all the fishermen, are very concerned and we are um, um, going to wait until it passes before we head out. And um, um, you, like you see all around is these traps, I got to wait until, until it passes so I can set these. So it could be a delay, probably a week, a week or so in the season. In a cold front, Carol says the built for tough traps can hold up to 30 crawfish at a time. But in the summer, the catch is far less. Not wasting any more time, Carol showed us just how the crustaceans are trapped. The lobster goes in here. Uh, when we pull them, we open it up, take out the lobsters. We even we bait it too. We, have, we put bait inside them. So we open up, take it up, and latch it, latch it, and... Throw it back overboard. And you haven't had any issues with them trying to escape or trying to... Take no, the out? only issues we have is with thieves. We have more... I hate to say this, but we have more thieves out on the banks than what we have living right here now. So everybody go to look for these and steal. But just how effective is trapping crawfish over sparing them? Well, diver Paul Malis responded this way. One of the great things about these traps is that the lobsters come in live. And like Mr. Carroll explained earlier, that means that you have more options. And one of the things that we as the National Fisheries Association stress our fishermen to do is to be flexible, to make yourself able to supply different markets at different times when things are bad. Mr. Carroll can su supply live lobster for the live lobster export. He can supply live lobster for people's restaurants like they have in Red Lobster across the United States. But if he can't get a, a market for his live lobster, he can always ring them out and he can always uh, freeze them as tails. But while storms pose a major threat to the livelihoods of fishermen across his country, Carroll remains hopeful that this one will not affect us at all. I can hark and I lose all my traps. I think all the other guys from Spanish Wells and all Long Island, they lose a lot of traps. So we uh, hopefully we don't have no storms and everything be well. Once it's time, we, everybody go for it full force and hope, and you know, you only can hope for the best. You don't know what's out there, you don't know how we can have a good season until you go. But we just hope the price be as um, like how it was last season. Drivers getting a better understanding on how they can operate under the recent emergency orders despite initial confusion. Cleopatra Murphy spoke with the Te Bahamas Taxi Union president on the matter. Taxi drivers are still allowed to operate despite renewed restrictions leading to another shutdown of buses amidst the resurgence in COVID-19 infections. However, President of the Bahamas Taxi Union, Wesley Ferguson, says a number of his members were told by police officers that they had to leave the Linden Pindling International Airport on Tuesday and they were not allowed to operate. Ferguson believes the confusion may have arisen from the subheading of the emergency orders, public transportation and taxi service, while the actual order prohibited bus operations. He says it was also surprising as there had been no notification from government. The reason for our disappointment is because we realize that there are residual tourists still staying in some Airbnb, some of the smaller hotels, and they are making reservations or making um, some kind of arrangement to leave the country, and some of these flights are not scheduled. So it means that whenever they have confirmation that there is a plane at the airport that could take them back to the United States, it simply means that they would have had, had some kind of transportation and they would prefer to have a taxi in this COVID environment because, you know, it's only you and the driver that is in the car. The union president says the matter has since been addressed after taxis are once again on the streets and he reached out to the Minister of Transport and Local Government, Senator the Honorable Dion Folks, who assured he would clear the issue up with the Commissioner of Police. He immediately um, sent me a message back and told me that he spoke to the Commissioner of Police and the taxi industry is now still open from, from business. So um, we can still do business within the confines of the uh, local community and um, we are here to take all the residual tourists back and forth to the airport and of course the country is still open to um, private yachts and private um, um, aircrafts. So in that vein, it is still important for those people to have some sort of transportation to and from the airport. 
He believes in the current environment, a taxi is the safest mode of public transportation, adding that those who travel together are from the same household. Taxi drivers took a major financial hit due to the initial COVID-19 economic shutdown and also had to make some adjustments to operate with COVID-19. Ferguson says it is a transition taxi drivers have made successfully. All of the protocols are basically the same. It's a standard protocol. You have to have hand sanitizers. You have to keep social distance. You have to um, make sure that you wear a mask at all time and everybody in your car is wearing a mask and you have to sanitize the vehicle. So that was a no-brainer. You know, it was, it, there's no special training or any extra um, um, paraphernalia or everything, anything like that that you would need to... Um, effectively um, operate a taxi cab in a safe manner. ZNS News attempted to reach Minister of Transport and Local Government Senator the Honorable Dion Folks about the initial confusion over taxi operation, but was unsuccessful. Commissioner of Police Paul Rowe, however, confirmed that taxi drivers are allowed to operate, while omnibuses specifically cannot. Cleopatra Murphy, SNS Network News. Thanks a lot, Cleo. The COVID-19 pandemic having a significant impact on litigation and arbitration in the court system. Chief Justice Brian Marie says major adjustments have been made in order to protect court staff and the public while ensuring that the courts remain open. The Chief Justice says court activities have been curtailed since March due to the pandemic. However, he says an operations plan is now in place. We have, up to this point, excluding Grand Bahama for a moment, they're under lockdown. We have restored substantially all of our court services as of today, with the exception of criminal jury trials in the Supreme Court and criminal summary trials in the magistrate's court. Those are two areas that we are working on, and we, in fact, do have dates, target dates, when we will be resuming those activities together with civil hearings in the magistrate's court. The Chief Justice also offered this advice to Family Island residents who may have a court case here in the capital but are unable to attend due to the suspension of inter-island travel. The best thing they can do is try to communicate with the clerk of the court or with the magistrate's court office, either by telephone or if they have access to emails. And once they communicate that they're off-island and they are, because of the restrictions, they cannot travel, then their name and their court case and their date will be taken, and that matter will be adjourned to a time when the restrictions are lifted and the parties will be able to attend. If you are a witness in a case, then similarly, you could inform the authorities or the court office that you aren't able to attend on the, on the fixed date because of the travel restrictions. Bahamians reacting to the emergency orders, including travel restrictions, COVID health protocols, and the upcoming weekend lockdowns being carried out to stem the spread of the deadly COVID-19 virus. Several residents told our news team they support the measures, while others feel some Bahamians aren't taking the measures seriously. We have to do what we have to do and follow the, follow the advice of our prime minister. You know, I think he's doing a, a wonderful job. No discontent. You know, you stay home and there's so much things you can find to do at home. I did some new things. I made mine go jam. It's a sacrifice we have to make to stay healthy. And I think he's doing the right thing, you know, because we don't know who have it. And we have our family at home. So we don't want to take it home to our families, you know. So it's a good, it's, it, it's doing a good thing. Uh, it's unfortunate that we get to this point where you got to be reminded to wash your hands and take care of the personal stuff. But honestly, I, I have no problem with it. We just need, as a country, we need, to be, we need to be vigilant of what's going on in the world and just take responsibility for what we're doing. Stay close. We've got more right after this. You're watching The Morning Edition. Successful parenting through COVID-19. Being at home with your child for a long time can feel stressful, especially when they misbehave. Children can also feel stressed as their daily routines have changed. Manage negative behavior through creating schedules, planning indoor activities and outdoor activities, giving responsibilities and rewarding good behavior. 
All children can be mischievous. You can discipline without yelling or physically harming by giving timeouts, taking away privileges, and even giving chores. It's okay to take a break. Pause for 10 seconds, breathe for five seconds, then give a calm response. Listen to your children's feelings and be supportive. Avoid unhealthy behaviors like drinking alcohol, smoking tobacco, or risky sexual behavior. Feeling overwhelmed? Contact our hotline at 819-7652 or any of the numbers that appear on your screen. It is important to take precautions to reduce your risk of getting infected with COVID-19 even when you go to the grocery store. Practice physical distancing that is six feet apart from others while you wait in line to enter the store. One person per household needs to go. Use wipes to disinfect the cart or basket handle that you select. Avoid touching your face, unnecessary items and surfaces. Try to touch only what you are buying. So carry a grocery list to help you move along quickly. Do not forget to wear a cloth mask while you do your shopping and carry hand sanitizer with you. Practice physical distancing that is six feet apart from others as you shop. And at the cash register. As little time as possible in the store and get enough groceries to last you for a while. Once your groceries are packed and loaded, use hand sanitizer and rub your hands together until they are completely dry. When you come home from the grocery store, take off your shoes at the door and put all of your grocery bags in one area. Disinfect your grocery bags. Rinse produce and wipe down cans and packages with soap and water before you put them away. Wash your hands thoroughly for 20 seconds when you are done. Wash your clothes and your reusable grocery bags. This message has been brought to you by the Ministry of Health in conjunction with the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas. So this morning, we continue our conversation with the commander of the Central Division of the Royal Bahamas Police Force on policing initiatives in that district. Here's Charles Fisher. Chief Superintendent Mary Mitchell heads one of the most busing and busiest districts of the Royal Bahamas Police Force. She has been in charge of the Central Police Station since May of this year. Central Division um, is considered the mother station of the Royal Bahamas Police Force. It is in the center of the downtown Bay Street community, which is known as the center of the city where all of the actions happens when it comes to tourism, banking, finance, shopping, and the likes. We have an awesome responsibility when it comes to policing the city. Um, when it comes to policing in generally, Central Division is uniquely different from other divisions in, this, in the force because of the historic center of the city where you have um, the Senate, the House of the Assembly building, you have the cabinet buildings, you have the straw markets, you have the downtown city center, you have the cruise ship port, which is the domestic hub for traveling for the tourists, you have all of the major hotels, and you have just everything happens downtown. One time ago, everything was in the downtown area. Well, it's not um, so central anymore, but it remains the, um, the center of the city. Central Police Station was one of the very first police stations that were formed way back in 1799, thereabouts. And in 1841, the Royal Bahamas Police Force was established. Now, the Central Police Station, even though it sits on East Street North at this time, the Central Police Station was once on Parliament Street, just east on in a public um, lot and it only comprised of a number of few constables at the time that did patrols on bicycles or on foot patrol 
And that beat at that time, way back um, in the 1800s, that beat consists of just Market Street in the west, Church Street in the east, to come around Shirley Street. Central used to be on Bank Lane, that used to include the Criminal Investigation Department, and then you had the Magistrates Court, you had the Supreme Courts and everything. Over the years, that position has changed. The CID area has outgrown the space and also Central Police Station has, out, has outgrown the space through Bank Lane and now we are situated on East Street North. While we had all of the activities going on there, the change has come where the majority, all of the magistrates court has since moved from Bank Lane Center to now Nassau Street, leaving 17 Supreme Courts in the Bank Lane City area. Um, we have 10 criminal courts and seven and seven civil courts that still sits in the in the bank lane area. She has met with the movers and shakers of the area, inclusive of strategic partners of the downtown development project. I would have caused these engagements to be held in order to find out how we can enhance the city area when it comes to policing and business slash and we can have a better city and know exactly what are some some of the challenges that we have from both sides of the fence great female in action for the morning edition i'm charles fisher have you given any thought on how to make your own shepherd's pie and the ingredients necessary? Well, our Kelsey Johnson shares her skills. Before dishing up a plate of my scrumptious shepherd's pie, I thought I'd share this tip with you. Sunday shopping is a breeze. I was in and out of the food store in less than 10 minutes. The items I picked up were less than $20, so you too can get chopping when it comes to this dish. I call it my on-a-budget Grammy Seeds shepherd's pie. First, I season my ground turkey with black pepper and salt. I then place it aside to marinate. While a large pot of salted water was boiling, I chopped up some onions, red and yellow bell peppers and placed them in separate bowls. I then washed and peeled my potatoes, cut them into chunks, dropped them into the boiling water, which I had previously added butter to. Now it's time to cook the meat. Yes, I know it's less than 10 minutes since I seasoned it, but I'm certain it will have a burst of flavor and mouth-watering taste. So with all of the ingredients in the pot, the ground turkey, onions, bell peppers, tomato paste, spinach, garlic, and thyme, the aroma at that point was to die for, right? Up next, melted butter with milk. Whisk that until soft. I'll use it for potatoes while mashing. Everything's looking delicious, so let me turn on the oven. Set that at 350 degrees. Stick a fork in the potatoes, checking to see if they're ready. It's a go for those, so it's time to drain the water and get to mashing. Here's where I add some of the butter and milk sauce with the potatoes. Continue mashing until I get a good texture. Let's turn the stove off and also my meat is done. Before I spread an even layer of the turkey meat, I need to add palm spray to the dish. Now it's time for a layer of mashed potato to the bottom. Spread that out. Up next, the ground turkey more mashed potatoes and cheese you can never go wrong with cheese shove this bad boy into the oven let it bake for 15 minutes or until the cheese melts and it's golden salads are always a healthy choice so i decided to make a small toss salad if you want to get fancy we'll call it a garden salad but to be honest it's iceberg lettuce tomatoes cucumbers and bell peppers my pie is ready grab my plate hey it's called what's on your plate so i have to make sure that my presentation is on point because we all know you should eat with your eyes first so here's my tossed salad that goes on the plate first. I'll rest the pie right next to it, drizzle that with some secret dressing, and voila! There you have it, my good old Grammy C shepherd's pie that makes you want to dance when you bite into it. Let's listen in on the reviews. Potatoes, cheese, ground beef, and it's nicely seasoned. Good job, Kelsey. The moment of truth. It tastes like she got some skills, though. 
<laughs> I love the combination. The cheese is nice and melted. It's flavorful. You did good, gal. You did good. Just call me Chef Lorraine. Kelsey Johnson and ZNS Network News. Stay close. The morning edition is back right after this. Andres is the number one born fishing destination on our planet. Sports fishermen visit our flats every year to participate in one of the most fulfilling outdoor activities known to man, fly fishing. And guess what? It's 100% sustainable. Without areas like the west side of Andres, sustaining this industry would be absolutely impossible. So let's take care of nature, and nature will take care of us. The Atlantic hurricane season runs from June 1st to November 30th. When a hurricane alert is issued for your area, which indicates the possibility that you could experience hurricane conditions within 60 hours, you should begin the initial stages of preparation for the storm. When the storm is 48 hours away, a hurricane watch is issued. Once a watch is issued, be sure to get updates from the Met Office via television or radio. Get your battery-powered radio ready. Keep your emergency supply kit, blankets and sleeping bags handy and keep children and pets indoors. Be sure you have extra cash and a car tank full of gas. Fill all prescriptions. A hurricane warning means that a storm with winds up to 74 miles per hour or more is 36 hours away. At this point, secure all windows with shutters and plywood. Place your valuables in a waterproof container and store them on the highest floor in your home or in the safest area. This public service announcement has been brought to you by the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas in conjunction with the National Emergency Management Agency. Hey, long time no see. You hear me? Long time no see. Ball fish, stew fish, stew conch. I love it all. Tourists come here to take our tours, experience our sun, sand, and sea, and they also spend money around town. I used to see a bunch of hog fish around here, but nowadays I hardly see any. You protect one area, the fish do their thing, make a bunch of babies that spread all over the sea. What's the problem? If we protect certain parts of our sea, it keeps all parts working right. I was against that face, but knowing what I know now, I totally agree having marine protected areas. I support marine protected areas. We support marine protected areas. Look for Bahamas Protected on Facebook. Sign the petition. Sign the petition. <laughs> A workout session with Natasha Brown. Hi, good morning, and thank you for joining downtown for another dynamic session. You got up, so what does that mean? You have not given up on yourself. I've got an awesome routine, strictly push-ups, all right, to give your arms the look you have been dying for. Let's get right into it.
downtown Natasha Brown, taking you closer to becoming your ultimate you. Here's your COVID health tip for today. To reduce your risk of COVID-19, it's important that you wear your face mask the right way. Your mask must cover both your nose and your mouth. Only covering your mouth is not enough because you can inhale respiratory droplets through your nose. If you and others around you are not wearing your mask properly, respiratory droplets from someone else can land in your nose, your mouth, and even your eyes. Or sometimes, someone's droplets can land on the surface that you touch. So you touch your eyes and your nose, and then you can become infected. There should be no gaps in between your face and your mask. In addition to wearing face masks, avoid touching your face. Practice physical distancing, proper hand washing, and disinfecting frequently. Touch surfaces. Most importantly, stay at do your part to prevent the spread of This message has been brought to you by the Ministry of Health. The Stafford Simpson Hurricane Windsail was developed in 1971 by civil engineer Herbert Taffer and meteorologist Robert Simpson, who was the director of the U.S. National Hurricane Center. It was introduced to the public in 1973 and began to be widely used a year later, inspired by the Richter scale that measures earthquakes. The Sanford Simpson scale was divided into five categories. Originally, the scale included predicted barometric pressures associated with the various wind speeds, as well as the relative kinds of damage that could be anticipated. However, because those predictions were found to be very inaccurate, just a few years ago, the warning system was changed to include only the wind speeds, which were also adjusted upwards in the higher categories. A Category 1 hurricane has wind speeds between 74 and 95 miles per hour. A Category 2 hurricane has wind speeds between 96 and 110 miles per hour. A Cat 3, 111 to 129 miles per hour. A Cat 4, 130 to 156 miles per hour. And a Category 5 hurricane will have wind speeds from 157 miles per hour and up. This public service announcement has been brought to you by the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas in conjunction with the National Emergency Management Agency. In our final look at weather, Tropical Storm Isaiah is now spreading heavy rains across uh, Puerto Rico and is now taking aim for Hispaniola, and that should happen within the next several hours, and uh, we will tell you more about that in just a short while. But right now, outside of our studios, uh, we have partly cloudy skies, temperature 82 degrees, a relative humidity at 83%, easterly winds at 5 miles bar, the barometric pressure 1,018.0 millibars, that is 30.10 inches and the pressure is steady. Temperatures around the islands uh, this morning, 82 degrees in Marsha, Babaco. Green Toll Key at 79, 79 also in Freeport, uh, Grand Bahama, the Berry Islands at 82. Alistair Bimini, 83 degrees, 83 in Harbor Island. Roxanne Elutra, 83, Otis Town, Island, 81. 83 in Staniel Key, Kemp Space Out Andrews at 83 degrees. Freshwick Central Andrews, 83 as well. In San Salvador, 81. Rum Key, 81 degrees. And as we take you a little further south, Ragged Island, 82. Clarence Town, Long Island, Crooked Island, 82. Betsy Bay, Maguana, 83 degrees. Acklands at 83. Matthew Tiny Niagara, 82. And the Turks and Caicos Islands at 82 degrees. 
and your boating forecast for today. Light and variable winds, that's for the northwest, Bahamas. Flat seas, one to three feet over the ocean, but this will all change as we head into the weekend. Low tide takes place at 10.52 in the morning, high tide at 5.24 in the afternoon. For the central islands, southeast winds, 10 to 15 knots, wave flies, two to four feet. However, we have a caution flag up, and that is because we anticipate some moderate swells to begin affecting the central Bahamas later on today. So boaters in the central Bahamas, we're asking you to simply stay in port. The southeast Bahamas, the winds northeast ahead of that approaching our tropical storm. Wind speeds 12 to 18 knots today. Wave heights 3 to 6 feet over the ocean. And this too will be increasing as the system gets a little closer. Caution flags are already up because of the occurrence of large swells in the southeast Bahamas. And like the central Bahamas, we're asking boaters in the southeast Bahamas to simply stay in port. Getting back to the tropics, you can now see the uh, area of uh, heavy showers and thunderstorms um, batting up uh, Puerto Rico as we speak, and that is now taking aim uh, towards uh, Hispaniola, which we said will happen in another few hours. The forecast track of this system will take it over Hispaniola later on today, and hopefully that will weaken the system. Right now, it's back in winds of 60 miles per hour. It's moving towards the northwest at 21 miles per hour. But once it starts to interact with the uh, mountainous terrain of Hispaniola, it is expected to uh, uh, lose uh, some of that sting. And uh, getting back into the waters of the Bahamas, which is pretty warm, we expect some intensification to take place. But if it continues to move at that uh, 20, 21 mile per hour clip, uh, well, it will be be out of here before it has any time to intensify to any degree of, uh, of level that will be devastating to us. So rainfall will remain the significant feature of this system with some strong gusty winds during the passage. So beginning tonight in the southeast Bahamas, they will start to experience those heavy showers that will gradually spread into the central Bahamas by Friday morning and by Saturday, we'll start to get those rain showers uh, and increasing over the northwest Bahamas as well as the system moved just slightly west of Andros and then taking aim for the Florida Peninsula by Sunday. Our forecast for today call for partly sunny and hot conditions with some late showers developing in the afternoon. The high temperature today about 90 degrees. Tomorrow, well, to, tonight I should say, uh, we're looking at partly cloudy conditions with again showers developing late in spots with a low temperature of 81 degrees. And your extended weather forecast, a wet weekend shaping up for us with lots of showers, heavy at times, strong gusty winds. Temperature-wise, we're going to keep them below 90 degrees once that cloud cover starts to move over as a result of tropical storm Isaiah's. But come Sunday, the skies will start opening up again as that system pushes off towards the north and west. But we'll have some residual showers and thunderstorms on Monday as a result of a feeder band that will continue to drag over the northwest Bahamas. But come Tuesday, lots of sunshine in our forecast, and that will take us right into the following weekend. Thanks a lot, Basil. Remember to stay tuned to the ZNS Network, your best choice for local, regional, and international COVID-19 coverage. For the entire team, I'm LaDawn Davis. Make it a fantastic Thursday, everyone.